Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege you've given us to serve you and to lead people to know you. Help us, Lord, that we do the work in such a way we'll be rewarded on the final day. Even in this life, we'll be rewarded all along the journey. Be with us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. We're still talking about serving the Lord and working for the Lord. Uh, we talk about that every Tuesday because that's why we're here. And I pray that you'll not be tired in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 36. Matthew 9, verse 36. In verse 36, we have the record of what actually happened as Jesus went about involved and busy for the work the Lord had given him. Verse 36, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In the earlier verses, and in particular in verse 35, we have been told that Jesus went about. And what was he doing? Teaching, preaching, and healing. Yet, after he had done very much, much work, we learned that he now saw the multitude, the people that needed to be ministered to. And then he was moved with compassion. Then did he say in verse 37, Then says he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Tonight I'm looking at the urgency of spiritual harvesting. The urgency of spiritual harvesting. The Lord Jesus referred to the work of evangelism, of discipleship, of planting churches, of building churches, of gathering fruit into the kingdom of God. He likened it to harvesting. And as you look at harvesting in the land of Israel, you will find that it was a major thing. And so the disciples understood the imagery, the picture that he was uh, using at that time. And as we bring it to the spiritual side, which is what Jesus did, and we're talking about the urgency. You look at G Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. Jeremiah 8, verse 20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. It gives us the impression that during that harvesting time, gathering fruit into the Ghana, or bringing souls out from the field of the world, and bringing them into the Ghana of the kingdom of God, all these should have been saved. And now these people lamented and said, See, the harvest is ended. The summer is gone. The period of service and the period of working, laboring, everything is ended now. And they suddenly realized that they were not saved. How it gives us then the impression that when the Lord will come, and we've been talking about the coming of the Lord. Last week we talked about the rapture. Of the church and now today we're talking about the great tribulation and the time will come when after all is done and the labor is over and the harvest is finished and all the preaching has been done and all the evangelists are done everything they could do and every church planter had gone everywhere had done all they are supposed to do and everything is over there will be people lamenting the harvest finished past the summer ended and yet here we are not saved how does should ring a bell and give an impression of the urgency 
of our service before the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, he himself recognized that urgency. And he labored in that way. In fact, he packed the three and a half years in which he ministered. He packed everything full with activity, with preaching and teaching and healing. Going about everywhere that the work will be done. And everyone that had been called by the Lord in answer to the prayer that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into the harvest field. Everyone that has responded to that call to service as a result of that prayer, they have felt the urgency and they have filled their lives with the work that ought to be done. And in fact, you know, when the time appears short, like three and a half years, and when somebody is coming at the 11th hour, and he knows i don't have so much time it looks like those people they sense they understand they feel the urgency more than we do uh, when the time is stretched out and we seem to have been born again 30 years ago 20 years ago and we've been doing the work and it appears that you know uh, the time is all there before me and we've done quite a lot. And now we are counting how many retreats we have done. How many conferences we have organized. How many youth programs we have gone through. And we'll see what the Lord has done. We seem to say, when are they going to give us recess? Holiday. Vacation. Resting time. And don't they understand that this body can get tired? Yes, you understand. But it's urgency in the work that we have to do. In John chapter 9, John chapter 9, reading from verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. That's the thing that drove Jesus. That's the thing that pricked him in the heart, so to say. That's the thing that put fire in his bosom. That's the thing that gave him a sense of urgency. There is something to do. And it must be done now. And I must work. And this is what we ought to say. Not just saying it verbally, but feeling it within. Knowing that this is true. And knowing that this should characterize a very life. So you wake up in the morning. And you know, you just uh, finish the program. And dead tired. I uh, see the only thing that I need now is a cold birth and a good sleep. And then you are able to get some rest. And then you wake up in the morning. And while people are thinking now, he is going to take some time off. And then you say, I must work. It's like, you know, what happened last Tuesday in America. And I called some of our friends there. And a particular friend I called, a Christian, a minister, an evangelist, he said, I'm here on site. That because of the things that, you know, happened. And thousands of people died. He said, I'm here on site. And I'm talking to the firemen and the policemen. And all the people, the Red Cross people that are helping gathering these, you know, dead bodies and all that. And everybody is being weary. You will. And when it appears, you pray for me. And then his, his voice was breaking. He was overcome with emotion. He had seen too many dead people. And he had seen too many tired people. And then he said, some of the firemen that were helping people, some of them too, they perished in that, in that holocaust. And the thing just came on them. And then he told me, almost trembling, he said, do you know my last daughter? I said, yes, I know her. I remember. Oh, she said, he said, my daughter was passing by that area 
and then that thing struck all of a sudden and then he said my daughter went to hysteria and for two hours we lost contact and it took some policemen to be able to guide that daughter and he said when i saw that eventually the daughter was all right when i saw that he said i see the urgency and the people are so open now he said keep on praying for us uh, you know uh, when you see the things happening in the world in which we live it has something in your heart and the only thing is tired yes weary yes fatigued yes and the flesh is saying maybe you cannot take another step then you say like jesus before the harvest passes and before the summer ends there is something to do and that is to harvest and bring a lot of people into the kingdom that's why jesus said that's what you ought to say i must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the night cometh when the night comes you have all the sleep you want all the relaxation you want all the vacation you want this is day of service the night comes when no man can work and so uh, the, the period you have uh, that's why you ought to push everything into it now do it and even when you are getting tired as you will you will and even when you are getting weary you will and when it appears you cannot take another step more that time will come maybe it's come now then you say yes i must still take another step and yet another step and yet another step because this is a day of opportunity the day of service that's actually why the lord had controversy with the children of israel in jeremiah chapter 5 jeremiah 5 verse 24 Jeremiah 5 24 neither say they in their heart let's now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain both the former and the latter in his season he reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest uh, the Lord had controversy of the children of Israel and said are these people not thoughtful are they not thinking don't they understand the weeks have given them they are the appointed weeks of the harvest neither said any of them to encourage one another lift up one another to put fire enthusiasm into one another neither said any of them that the lord had given us this and given us this and given us this and has given unto us reserved unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest and that's why we need to be telling one another encouraging one another instead of slowing down one another instead of saying what's coming on you that are you going to die on the job and just walk don't you know you need rest don't you know your family needs you don't you know that your children need to enjoy you you want to do it like so and so eccentric in the work of god and not putting common sense into it you want to die if you understand the urgency of the harvest you will not say anything to discourage another individual you'll be encouraging one another the lord has reserved unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest three points number one the condition of the end time harvest field the condition of the end time harvest field as you look at the harvest field we're talking about men and women we're talking about boys and girls we're talking about the people that are out there that we need to preach to and bring them into the kingdom look at the condition of the end time harvest field in second timothy chapter three second timothy chapter three reading from verse one there's no also that in the last days pretty lost time shall come for men shall be think about this these are the people you are going to preach to 
these are the people you are going to minister to. If you think it's going to be easy, you don't understand the condition of the latter day harvest field. If you think it's going to just be an easy ride over, you know, we're going to evangelize and the people are going to come to the Lord and the people, they're waiting for us and we're going to bring many people in. If you think it's going to be as easy as that, you don't understand the condition of the end time harvest field. Here is the condition. Men, the people you are going to be preaching to will be lovers of their own self. They'll be full of self. Seeking only of what he can gain rather than what the Lord demands of them. They'll be covetous. They'll be boasters. They'll be proud. And they can't think that they are not born again. They can't accept they are not saved. They can't accept that you, of all people, that you know anything more than they know. And these are the people you are going to be ministering to. And they'll be blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And especially youth leaders. Where are you? Can you stand up? Let me see. Those who are youth leaders. You're so many and you'll do this work. I said you will do this work. You can see that. See, the children you are going to be ministering to. The young people you are going to be ministering to unthankful you pour out your life on them trying to bring them to the kingdom you abandon your future education you give up everything running after them after all is done said and done these children might turn around never is thank you unholy unthankful disobedient even blasphemers but that's the condition of the end time harvest field and if you came to the lord when you were very young yourself and you know the way you used to respect your leaders and your teachers and those who brought you to the lord you almost regarded them like a semi-god a little god but these children they regard you as a semi-devil a little devil you know you don't want them to enjoy life and you know you have enjoyed when you give your testimony you think you think you know i'm going to challenge these young people i'm going to give them my testimony you'll say you know young people you need to know the lord now you are lucky especially those of you that were born in christian homes you say raise up your hand they raise up their hands you say you know i wasn't as lucky as you are because when i was young i did this i did this i did this i did that but eventually when i suffered and i saw that those things will destroy me i now when i had the gospel it didn't take me time i embraced the gospel i was born again and since that time things are different now and you think that those children are going to say i want to be born again now 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 <laughs> they will say sir you enjoyed life after you enjoyed that side it's okay for you now now you have come to the lord that's what we are saying daddy and mommy they didn't allow us to enjoy life you have enjoyed so that's why we will go and enjoy our lives too don't be discouraged when we enjoy we finish everything what you are saying like you we will come back you think that the thing will interest them. And that is the condition of the present day harvest field. That's why you need to buckle up and brace up and tighten your belt and know that it's not going to be easy. And then in verse 3, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers. Sometimes you don't do anything but settling quarrels only incontinent fears despisers of those that are good traitors heady talk about being stubborn i minded lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god and then having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof you you think about the many people you see today they can recite the doctrines even outside they know some of these things 
And then, if you think things are going to be better, please read verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, somebody, somebody said, when I was having some difficulties, I thought it would be over. You know, and I prayed and prayed and prayed. And I thought everything would be over in six months or one year. And I said, well, uh, no condition is permanent. This thing is going, to be, is going to be over in one year. And then the fellow said, you know what? One year is gone, two years, gone, three years, gone, four years, gone. And, and the condition instead of becoming better is becoming worse. That's the condition of the last day, end time harvest field. Get ready. That sinners are going to be more sinful. Religious people that reject the gospel, they're going to be more religious and more hardened. That's a condition of the end time harvest field. But we will do the work. I said we'll do the work in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Is a condition of the latter day harvest field. The people that we have to preach to in the last days, that's the condition. That's what will be happening. Even the people that appear to have been born again, loving the Lord and fervent in love, it says their love will wax cold. While you're trying to evangelize on this side, the people you evangelized before, they are getting cold and they're getting they are compromising. You rush back to them, you want to do something. While you are doing that, the people that were almost saved before, they are back into the world again. Then you run back again to and fro. The condition of the end time harvest field in second peter chapter 3 verses 3 and 4 knowing this first that there shall come in the last days coffers walking after their own lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation for this they're willingly ignorant of willingly ignorant eh, they just they don't want to know they don't want to understand eh, you might try to explain and explain and explain deliberately they just seal up their hearts that they will not understand that they will not see if that is a condition do we then just give up no we can't give up we have an assignment we have a duty well, something the Lord has called us to. And whatever the condition of this present day harvest field, you're preaching, they are not yielding. You're evangelizing, they are not evangelized. You're you are discipling and they are not discipled. You keep on doing it because the Lord has called you to it. And it must be done. And you have no other reason why you are alive. The reason why God is protecting you and God keeps you alive is because of the work he gave you to do. If you abandon that work, and you say, no, I cannot do it because of the condition of the end time harvest field. Then the Lord will say, oh, am I wasting my time, my resources, protecting you, giving you security, and providing for you? And the reason I'm doing all that is so that you can do the work. And since you have given yourself compulsory vacation, and you have absented yourself, and you have gone without being given permission to go, then you are by yourself. Look to yourself, protect yourself. And you know, and you know the condition of the world now. If God leaves any man, any woman to himself to protect himself to shield himself and he removes the guardian angels from him and he says leave him alone what he's doing now i can't pay for that one what he's doing now i can't protect him for that one he's leaving to himself by himself now leave him alone if the guardian angels of god and the 
promises of God as the hedge around you. If that is removed because you want to do your own thing, we are gone. This present world, you are gone in one day. And they will not, they will not even see you on the map. The world in which you live. And that's the reason why you'll say, no matter the condition of the world in which you are living, the Lord has called you to get the thing done and it will be done. I said, it will be done. In First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I'm telling you, if there is anything that makes, um, you know, a leader, Christian leader, pastor, teacher, if there's anything that makes him to just feel like, give it up. It's not worth it. It's when you've labored and labored and labored on the church. And then some doctrines of demons come along. And the people you think are very sure, no, so, so and so never, can never be deceived. So and so never, can never be deceived. When you see those people departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and yielding their mind, and they become committed to doctrines of devils, you know, it, sometimes it makes you to feel, what's the point? There's no point again, but there's point. is prophecy as a condition of the last days. Those things are going to happen. And all you need to do is just, just keep on, just keep on, just keep on doing it. Speaking hypocrisy, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience, like what? <laughs> How? Seared with a hot iron. You know, you hear some people who had been, you know, Christians before. Now they, they have departed from the faith. They're giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And they say some things and they do some things. Then you hang your head and say, does he have a conscience? Do they have conscience? Don't ask. Go back to the Bible. They speak lies in hypocrisy. And then it says their consciences are seared with a hot iron. Well, if that is the condition of the last days, what's going to be their reaction then? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, for the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their laws, their own laws, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know what they'll tell you? We have not stopped serving God. That we're not listening to you. You mean you mean that means that we're no more serving we are serving God? It's just that we change class, we change church, and the teacher was teaching us before, we just got fed up. We still have teachers. But it will be teachers of their own kind. Teachers that will say what they want to hear. Teachers that will allow them to write the syllables and review the curriculum. They have teachers too. They have preachers too. They have the people who, who talk to them. But the point is, they don't want sound doctrine. After their own laws, they heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. It will just be story, story, story. Storytelling. No more sound doctrine. What are we to do then? Number two. The consecration of the end time harvest force. Harvest force. And the people that will do the harvesting, the reaping, the gathering, the souls into the kingdom of God in these last days uh, will need to be consecrated people. Consecrated people. In Psalm 126, Psalm 126, verse 5, verse 6, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. They that sow in tears 
shall reap in joy. <laughs> you know, uh, not, not many years ago, uh, one of uh, good, dependable, trusted, hardworking, you know, uh, workers, leaders came to me and said, I think I want to call it quit. I don't want to continue again. I said, why? I said, have I offended you? Or somebody else offended you and you are picking it on God and you are saying, you know, God, I'm going to leave your work because so and so offended me. He said, no, nobody offended me. I said, tell, you must tell me why. And one of the trusted, dependable people, he said, because to tell the truth, I don't have joy in this in the service again and since i'm just doing it just doing it and there's no joy i felt how can i continue that's why you continue you sow in tears doesn't matter doesn't matter it's not going to be all joy excitement and laughter every time oh there are times when you are harvesting and some of the some of the thorns will prick your hand prick your leg tear your clothes and some of the things will not really tear your clothes, tear your flesh. And there are some of the times, ask the farmers, you don't know that a snake is there, and the snake bites you, you have poison, and uh, you know, almost dying. I remember when we, when we were on the farm many years ago, because my father was a farmer. And that's why I understood all, all these things. You know, we were, were doing the normal work, farming. And my father was not there, but we then the people that were walking, they saw a rabbit or something. And they began to pursue the rabbit. And then I, as they were pursuing, you know, as a young fellow, I was excited. I was running. And the rabbit was running after me. And they wanted to kill the rabbit, and they had a sharp cutlass. And as they wanted to pull the cutlass on the, on the rabbit, they landed the cutlass on my leg. We didn't laugh at that time. It's only now we can laugh. But, but they pursued the rabbit. They left me alone with my leg bleeding. And they killed that rabbit. The only reward I had was to eat the head of that rabbit. But you know, we didn't run away from the farm because they cut my leg and the mark is still there. More than 40 years ago and the mark is still there. But we didn't stop farming because of that. The tears will come. The difficulties will come. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. You will reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You see, you are going forth and you are weeping, but you are consecrated and you continue to get the work done. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 4 and there it says he that observeth the wind shall not sow he that regarded the clouds shall not reap look away from the winds and look away from the clouds look away from the difficulties and keep on doing the work the Lord has called you to do in Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 13 the slothful man says there is a lion in the way a lion is in the streets you know when we're lazy we, we magnify the problems magnify the difficulties there's a lion in the way a lion in the street and it will tear me to pieces therefore i cannot do anything all those things we're going to cancel from our lives in galatians chapter 6 galatians chapter 6 reading there in verse 9 let us not be weary in well doing for in this season we shall reap if we faint not 
uh, that's telling us to be consecrated to be committed to the work uh, of course you understand the example of paul the apostle it always interests me uh, when i read about this paul the apostle and and he said that he did everything by grace and he paul the apostle had such grace i believe such grace is available for every one of us too in acts of the apostles chapter 14 verse 3 long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the lord which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands but the multitude of the city was divided and part held of the jews and part of the apostles but that didn't stop paul he was consecrated and committed he went on for seven and there they preached the gospel and there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same had Paul speak, who steadfastly, beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, in the speech of the Lacunia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. They, they even honored them beyond description. And they called Barnabas, Jupiter, and Paul, Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and gallants unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out sirs saying sirs why do ye these things we are also we also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and the earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered us, permitted us, allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left us, he left not himself without a witness, without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness and with these things curse restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them i read all that to you for you to understand verse 19 when paul the apostle ministered to that individual and a fellow got healed supernaturally uh, they did more than praising them. They did more than flatter them. They actually elevated them to the position of gods. And they even wanted to do sacrifice to them. But I don't think that, you know, things are going to be like that every day. Verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead see in the world this world in which you are living today they will sing hosannas and tomorrow they are going to say crucify him and today you'll think everybody appreciates and accepts you and they're even ready to praise and even flatter you but the following day and they are ready to even crucify you and stone you if you are not careful you will say well they used to respect me they used to honor me they used to appreciate me and but now since they don't need me anymore they don't want me anymore and they even want to you know see what they have done see what they are saying then you quit you say that's all i can't do it again they stoned him and left him for they thought he had died if they knew he had not totally died you have finished him there in verse 20 how be it as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up. And what did he do again? Tell me. And he came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had 
preached the gospel to that city and had taught many. They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Paul, do you understand what you're doing? That place where they stoned you, left you to die. You are going there again. It's a lesson for us. It's a man of like passions as we are. He himself said so while talking to the people. We are men of like passions as you are. Don't do this kind of vanities. Elevating us to be like idols and gods. Jupiter and Mercurius. And yet, even though he had suffered all that, here is consecration. Here is commitment. Here is the knowledge that we have only one life. And the only thing to do while you are breathing is to make sure that you are still preaching this word, preaching the gospel. That's why I still went back there and taught many. And in verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we, through much tribulation, will enter into the kingdom of God. I pray that the Lord will give us such consecration. Point number three, the conservation of the end time are vested fruits. The conservation of the end time are vested fruits. When we are, by the grace of God, brought some fruits during the harvesting time unto the Lord, into the kingdom of God, and we need to make sure that we still keep on helping, walking, girding, protecting, maturing, so that these affected um, vested fruits will be gathered into the kingdom and kept in the kingdom. In John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Verse 34. Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Please, keep on asking yourself. Keep on asking yourself. The work the Lord has given me to do. Have I finished? And if you know you have not finished, move on. Keep on doing it. Rain, sunshine, heat, cold, mosquito, gossip, criticism, whatever. Finish before you quit finish too many uncompleted buildings in our community finish too many dropouts from our educational system finish too many people that just before they reach the place they ought to reach they quit finish too many miscarriages and abortions finish it up if carry that pregnancy for seven months eight months don't quit don't quit. Finish. You know, many, many people, they, they yield to discouragement easily. And, you know, this is happening. This is happening. There's somebody building a house for 10 years, gets it to the roof, then abandons it. And by the time you come back in just one year, weeds have grown, the, the walls have cracked, and the snakes are making their, their place their place of abode and habitation. Finish it up. The work the Lord has given us to do. And that's what Jesus said. He said, my meat, the very central thing, my sustenance, the thing that sustains me is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work you'll finish your work nobody will intimidate you and make you run away from the great assignment the lord has put in your hand when you get to heaven and god crowns you and put shining stars in your crown you look back and you say thank god i finished will you finish or will you like to die by the wayside? <laughs> what, what are you going to show for your labor? You've, you've gone through the farm. And they caught your leg instead of killing rabbit. And the thorns pricked your hand. And yet, in all labor, you couldn't bring any fruit home. What do you think my father would have thought? If we came back from the farm. 
and all we could show was my bleeding leg and there was no rabbit and there was no fruit all those people went to the farm to do they just cut my leg and that's the only thing and once they cut my leg they stopped pursuing that rabbit and they stopped doing the work and then we went back home defeated and hurt and crying what kind of people will we be finish it up the lord has called you and you know upon this rock i built my church and you are part of that church i said you are part of that church and the gates of hell shall not overcome shall not prevail and will not prevail over the church the whole church any part of that church did he prevail over moses they won't prevail over you joshua did he prevail over him the gates of hell will not prevail over you david think about it the great work he had to do and the challenges and saul oh he ran after that young man uh, one man one day david he was you know uh, discouraged because they had burnt the city of fire they took his wives away and they took their property away and all their people the people that were even supporting him they took their property away and remember david he had not even taken the throne yet it, god was just preparing him the real work was still ahead to be done and all the supporters everybody came and they said they wanted to stone david and david you are talking of a soldier you are talking of somebody a kill goliath you are talking of somebody with iron constitution a man that never ran when the lion came into the fold a man that never ran away when the bear came to the fold i'm telling you that man and the thing was so much on him and to hear that david cried i'm telling you that was something <laughs> but he didn't cry forever he encouraged himself encourage yourself in the lord your work will not be in vain the lord will reward the work of your hand even though night may continue for a season the morning will come your joy will come the goodness of the lord will shine upon your life and as saul and satan could not overcome david nothing will overcome you finishing it up doing it until it's done until it's all over until you can say by the grace of god we have brought the harvest into the kingdom into the ghana before you ever stop how can you stop until we all gather up there that's what the lord is telling us do you believe you can continue can you still do the work until you finish now the fruit that will bring we gathered them into the Ghana. It says in this John, look at it. In John chapter 4, reading there in verse 35, Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are ready to harvest. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that's the purpose that's the reason you're doing the work you labor you're reaping to gather fruit unto the harvest unto life eternal without gathering the fruit unto life eternal what have you done if you just heat and run if you just evangelize and gather in the fruit and you leave the fruits there on the field without gathering them into the storehouse for conservation and preservation what have you done it says he gathereth the fruit unto life eternal and that's what the lord wants you to do and that's what we will do by the grace of god in matthew chapter 3 Matthew chapter 3 
I'm looking at verse 12 there. Uh, there it says, Whose fan is in his hand, and it will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat unto the gan into the Ghana. Uh, it's, it's when you bring those souls in, and those souls are gathered into the kingdom, and they remain in the kingdom. And that's when the work is really done. In John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verse 39. And this is the Father's will. Which has sent me. That of all which he has given me. I should lose nothing. But shall raise it up again. At the last day. Of all that the Lord gives us. Whether they are young or they are old. Whether they are men or they are women. And whether they are in the language section or in the English section. Of all the people that the Lord had given us in our evangelism. Avesting that we should preserve them, conserve them, keep them, lose none. Until everyone is brought into the kingdom of God and kept in the kingdom of God. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts. Chapter 15, verse 25. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That's verse 28. Verse 25. It seemed good unto us, being as simple with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have asserted their lives for the name of our lord jesus christ you see that it is their commitment their consecration oh it was tough they hazarded their lives for the name of our lord jesus christ much was done but they knew the importance of preserving that fruit and in verse 36 and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. They counted as very important that the souls they are brought to the kingdom of God, that those souls will be preserved that's why Paul told Barnabas and said, you know what? The, the, the commitment and the labor, the sweat that we have gone through in bringing those souls from the harvest field and bringing them to the kingdom of God. Let's go again. Let's see how they are doing. And Barnabas determined to take with them. John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them. Look up here. When we forget our focus, when we forget our vision, when we forget our goal, when we forget the assignment and the duty and the responsibility. Some minor, minor things, non-essentials will attract our attention. All our energy, all our resources will put on that minor, insignificant thing because we lost focus. Barnabas lost focus. John Mark was not part of the assignment. Separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I've called them to. And they had done the work. And Paul said to Barnabas, let's finish up. Let's go back to the place where we labored. And let us see 
how they are doing. He said, all right, that's, that's a reasonable thing to do. But then he said, this John Mark will go. Ah, Paul said, don't you even talk about that. That's not part of it. He will not go. What do you mean? He will go. I said he will not go. I said he will go. I said he will not go. Ah, if he will not go, <laughs> you know, they shifted focus. And that's what the devil likes. For you now to take all your energy, all your resources, and the excitement, and the energy you have, and the energy you use in preaching the gospel, and the force, and the logic, and the argument to take everything now, and concentrate that energy and that logic and that argument concentrate it on john mark Barnabas, what are you doing don't expend your energy on that thing it's not part of the deal how many people shift their focus and the thing that is not part of the deal not part of the assignment the devil is blindfolding us. And of course, even Paul himself, he was involved. He too, he too argued. Paul, why are you arguing? What's the matter? Even if Barnabas says, let's take John Mark. Don't let this John Mark separate you. Don't let it remove your focus from the place. Don't lose Barnabas because of that. Paul, what's wrong? You're filled with the spirit. You know the mystery of the kingdom. You know this is the tactics of the devil. Paul, why are you arguing with Barnabas? If your mark goes with you, what have you got to lose? Paul and Barnabas, what are you arguing about? If your mark stays at home, what do you lose? Stay on your focus. And I come to tell you, church, do you think the devil is happy with what we're doing here? Is the devil happy? All these other churches, do you think they're happy? They're not happy, maybe. Do you think the demons are happy? And do you think that in the work we're doing, you know, these young people coming to the Lord and, you know, men and women, this conference, that conference, and the devil is see this deeper life. They are tearing my kingdom. He is not happy. So, the devil is going to give you and I a John Mark that we'll begin to argue about that we spend all our energy on that we fight on and while i'm fighting you and you are fighting me the devil is destroying the work we did before and we lose all the work we have done john mark Barnabas says you'll come. Holy Ghost didn't bring you as part of us but john mark wants uh, Barnabas wants you come or Barnabas. You know, if two vehicles are coming directly, headlong, I am right. The other vehicle says, I am right. Full speed. In front of one another. If that man doesn't turn, I will prove to him I am right. Me, I say me, saved, sanctified, bold, fearless, I will not turn for anybody. I am right. You are right. I am right. We are driving. We have collision. Funeral ceremony. We will die. As we are together. Situations will arise in the church. We have a lot to do. We don't have energy for any extra, extra thing. Even the energy we have is barely sufficient to do the work we need to do. John Mark or not John Mark, let's move on. Let's get the work done. And the Lord will reward you, reward all of us on the final day in Jesus' name. Take your energy back from the argument on John Mark. Take your energy back on all the other things you have been concentrating on. Bring your energy back to this work. 
A lot to be done. Let's concern.